me get a little closer to your kids so you can see the pictures, okay? Hello, everybody. I'm John. Tell me all your names. Gabby. Gabby. Who, what's your name? Oh, yes, that's a good name. What's your name? Oh, Lily, now that's a nice name. That's one of my favorite names. Get, why don't you get, let's get a chair for you. You shouldn't have to stand up. You're sure you're all right? Okay. Well, I'm going to read you kids' books today with wonderful pictures. That's the reason why I came down a little closer to you so you can see the pictures. If you kids over there, if any of you want to come a little closer and sit right in the grass, I guess it's a little bit damp, but come on over here so you're nice and close. It's pretty wet grass, but it might be nice to get a little wet today. How is this? Is this a little bit better? I'll move back a little bit, and then you can be in the shade, too. Ooh, it really is wet. I don't want you to get wet bottoms. You're a little old for that, aren't you? Okay, I'm going to read you. These are books that I wrote myself. I'm going to read you three books. The Remarkable Farkle McBride. You see, you know I wrote it because my name is right on the back. See? See? That's me. And then I'm going to read you Mahalia Mouse Goes to College. And I'm going to finish up with a, a book called I Got Two Dogs. And that's not just a storybook, that's a song. So I'll sing that to you and you can all help me sing it, okay? And we'll just... All that music in the background, we'll just ignore that. We'll just, we'll just listen to a story, okay? This one is about a little boy named Farkle McBride. And Farkle McBride is a child prodigy. Does anybody know what a prodigy is? A, a prodigy is somebody who's very young, but who is very, very, very good at music. This is about a little boy who was very, very good about music. So this is a story about music, and it's about the orchestra. And he was a prodigy. He was very good with music, even when he was a little baby. See him in the, even when he was in his crib, he reached up at his mobile that had all these little musical instruments and notes. He was always a prodigy. And he's also got a very bad temper. But bit by bit, he gets control of his temper. Oh, pity the prodigy, Farkle McBride. No matter what instrument poor Farkle tried, whether strumming or blowing or drumming or bowing, his musical passions were unsatisfied. See, that's a picture of Farkle. Farkle, you see how unsatisfied he looks? No, 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 he says, that's not quite enough for me. That's the picture of Farkle McBride. Can everybody see Farkle in the back? When Farkle McBride was a three-year-old tyke, all freckly, bony, and thin, he astonished his friends and his family alike by playing superb violin. See him up in the corner playing the violin? He was a very good violin player, even when he was only three years old. He went reedly deedly deedly dee with all of the strings at his side. Reedly deedly deedly dee, the remarkable Farkle McBride. See him playing the violin with a great big orchestra, and he stands in the string section. The strings is where the violins and the violas and the cellos are and the big bass fiddles. He, he played with the strings and he was very, very good at it. But when he was four, Farkle played it no more in spite of his parents beseeching. He shattered the records he used to adore. He smashed up his rosin, ripped up every score. He threw fiddle and bow to the living room floor as he shouted, Enough of your screeching! See, he got tired of playing the violin. He just couldn't stand the sound anymore, even though he played it very, very well. 
When Farkel was five, his melodical gift once again bore rhapsodical fruit. The woodwinds inspired his spirits to lift, and he rapidly mastered the flute. See him playing the flute in the window? And there's a little bird out there singing outside the window because don't worry, you'll see him. See him playing the flute? And why do you think the birdie is singing along with him? Why? Because a bird sounds just like a flute, and he likes that sound. But what do you think is going to happen? Well, first of all, he plays with the orchestra. He went rootily tootily tootily too with all of the winds at his side. Rootily tootily tootily too, the remarkable Farkle McBride. See him way back there, and he's he's standing with the winds. It's the wind section of the orchestra. That's the oboes and the clarinets and the bassoons, and the, the piccolo, and the flute. But at six, Farkle flung his flute into the lake, notwithstanding its lyrical trill. He stamped on the dock till you'd think it would break. That's it, he exclaimed. I've had all I can take. That tootling gives me a brutal headache. It's so wimpy and whiny and shrill. See, where does he throw his flute? Where does he float, throw into the lake and look? Because he just didn't like the sound of it anymore, even though he played it beautifully. He made a beautiful sound, but he got tired of it. He kept getting tired of the music he was making, even though he was very good at it. When Farkle was seven, a different sound rekindled his musical flame. He became the most expert trombone player around and the boulevards buzzed with his name. Look at him playing the trombone. Can you say trombone? Trombone. It makes a wonderful sound. It makes a sound like he went roopity doompity doompity doom with all of the brass at his side. Roopity doompity doompity doom, the remarkable Farkle McBride. And there he is playing the trombone in the brass section. And the brass section has the trombone and the trumpet and the tuba, all the things that you make a big, bright, brassy sound with. But at eight, he declared to his parents' despair, and as anyone else might have guessed, I can't stand the trombone with its blat and its blare. That racket is more than my eardrums can bear, so return it or throw it away. I don't care. I despise it just like all the rest. And where did he throw his beautiful trombone? In the trash, he threw it in the trash. You don't do that with a beautiful trombone. Yes, he got, he got tired of that one too. That's exactly what happened. He got, kept getting tired of all the instruments, even though he was very, very good at it. But when Farkle was nine, both his father and mum were bursting with pride and affection for Farkle learned xylophone, cymbals, and drum, the entire percussionist section. He learned to play all the drums and the xylophones and the cymbals. Well, you should learn to play drums then because they're really, really fun to play. Look at him. Look how much he enjoys it. He went boom, bash, clang, and a clash, all the racket that he could provide. Tinkly, bing, bong, bumpity, crash, the remarkable Farkle McBride. Look at him playing those drums. He was so good at those drums, but what do you think happens? What do you think happens to Farkle? He did it again. Soon he fell prey to his usual gloom, despite all the praise and the flattery. First a sigh, then a sulk, then a frown, then a fume, then an ear-splitting tantrum that emptied the room. I can't take it, he bellowed, the crash and the boom and the clang and the bang of the battery. Look at him, so mad. He takes those symbols and he covers his ears with them. See how impatient and angry he is? What's the matter with that boy? He makes such wonderful music, but he doesn't like the sound of it. He gets... It's exactly right. He gets so tired of every... But listen to what happens. It's going to have a happy ending, don't worry. Poor Farkle at 10 
howsoever renowned, reached the end of his musical tether. But soon, he discovered his favorite sound. Musicians all playing together. See, see his bright idea? I know, I know what I like. I like it when they're all playing together. It happened like this. The conductor caught cold on the day of a major recital. You've got to replace him, young Farkle was told. Your cooperation is vital. See, that's the conductor blowing his nose because he caught cold and Farkle has to replace him because he's so good at all the different instruments. So he took his baton and he gave the downbeat and kaboom! The foundations were shaken by glorious music, bombastic and sweet, that filled up the hall and spilled into the street. Music that brought the whole crowd to its feet from the instruments he had forsaken. They went readily, rudely, roomity, bang, bravo, all the spectators cried. Deedly, doodly, doombity, clang, the remarkable Farkle McBride. Since that sparkling night, maestro Farkle McBride conducts all the instruments he ever tried. His happy heart sings to brass, drums, winds, and strings, the four sections of the orchestra, and remarkable Farkles at last, satisfied. And look how the book ends. Here's a huge picture of the whole orchestra with Farkle up on the podium. That's what, what it's called. He's a maestro now. He's a conductor now. And he gets to conduct all those instruments. And he's finally happy. See? And if you look carefully at this book, you can see every single instrument in a great big orchestra. And he is the conductor of that orchestra. See, so it is a happy ending. And there's a little, it's not completely over. Let me show you the last page. The last page is not part of the story. It's just a little picture that tells a story. It's a bouquet for his big opening night. And you know what the little card says on his bouquet? To Farkle, love, mom and dad. And that's the end of the story. You like that story? Me, I wrote it. Okay, this story is called Mahalia Mouse Goes to College. Now I assume, I bet none of you go to college now, right? Raise your hands if you go to college. Nobody goes to college? Raise your hands if you want to go to college someday. Good for you, good for you. Well, just keep on going to school, you'll get to college. And believe me, college is a wonderful thing to go to. And this is a story about how much fun it is. Your sister already goes to college? Well, you must be very proud of her. This is a story about Mahalia Mouse, a mouse who ends up going to college. Now, you're not mice, but Mahalia Mouse, you wouldn't think a mouse could go to college, would you? Well, eventually, Mahalia Mouse does go to college, just like all of you are going to college. Here it goes. Here's the story, and I'll show you all the pictures. The skies of September were bursting with rain, pelting the old dormitory. It filled every gutter and choked every drain. Chapter one of Mahalia's story. You see, the picture of a very, very rainy day in a college town. A family of mice huddled up to keep warm. Their basement was flooded with water. The mother peered out at the furious storm, then turned and addressed her young daughter. Mahalia, darling, she said with a sigh, your father's not back till tomorrow. So wrap up in newspaper, keep yourself dry, and find us some cheese or a scrap of meat pie. The children are starving, the babies may die. Then she faltered, consumed by her sorrow. See, they're in real trouble because in the basement of the dormitory, there's a flood and they've got to find some water. 
uh, some food and water. So Mahalia, see there's little Mahalia mouse. She again set out on a mission to find some food. Mahalia hugged her, then scampered outside, sheltered by clumps of wisteria. In minutes, she'd found a secure place to hide in a hall by the dorm cafeteria. See her running through the quadrangle of the college? Nearby lay a backpack, unclaimed on the floor, smelling of cheese and roast beef. Mahalia climbed up inside to explore like a seasoned, self-confident thief. She found a fat sandwich and plucked out the cheese, stuffing it into her sack. But suddenly, zip! A sharp sound made her freeze as everything faded to black. Imprisoned in darkness, she tumbled and tossed. But what could Mahalia do? Tormented by fears of a grim holocaust, she pictured her home and her family lost. A sack full of cheese had been bought at such cost. Mahalia's Tale, Chapter Two. The backpack went bump as it came to a rest, then zip opened up to the light. Peeping outside it, the mouse was distressed by a strange, unfamiliar sight, a room unlike any she'd been in before, full of rows upon rows of young students. In terror, she beat a retreat to the door, repenting her recent imprudence. But a voice held Mahalia fast in her place. This course is extremely advanced. It concerns the behavior of atoms in space, their collisions and fissions, their motion and pace. Don't take it unless you're an absolute ace. Mahalia Mouse was entranced. See, that's the picture of the professor in the college. In her lonely new lodgings, she took the course on, overwhelmed by its daunting regime. But one night as she slept in the hour before dawn, her mother appeared in a dream. My baby, she said in a quavering voice, you're off to a wonderful start. Don't think about us. Just believe in your choice. Be happy and follow your heart. See, that's her mother in a dream talking to Mahalia. Thereafter, whenever she sneaked into the class, the mouse would recall every word. But one day, in the midst of a lecture, alas, the unthinkable finally occurred. <gasps> a mouse! An ear-slitting shriek pierced the air, and instantly chaos took hold. Where? People screamed. Over there! Over there! Some ran for an exit. Some leaped on a chair. Mahalia, trembling with fright and despair, felt the blood in her body run cold. Everybody suddenly saw Mahalia in the classroom, and they all screamed and ran because they were so frightened of a mouse. The professor stepped forward to calm the class down. He stood at Mahalia's side. He stared at her notes with a studious frown. This mouse is a genius, he cried. Her grasp of the subject is sharp as a blade. This rodent will study with me. By noon, he had kept the bold promise he'd made. Her books were all purchased. Her lab fees were paid. Her doubts and her fears were completely allayed. Mahalia Mouse, chapter three. That day marked the start of four glorious years. Mahalia Mouse went to college. Admired and respected by all of her peers, she gathered a broad range of knowledge. Along with her major, she dabbled in art, in history, math, and zoology, but one course especially captured her heart, the basics of human psychology. Activities, too, filled Mahalia's days, for no shrinking violet, she. Fencing and football, recitals and plays, glee club and squash, a brief square dancing phase. 
At the end of four years of achievement and praise, it was time to receive her degree. As she giddily braced for her June graduation, a hundred reporters all sought her, and that's how her parents, in wild jubilation, stumbled on news of their daughter. At commencement, Mahalia marched with her class, perched on a friend's brawny shoulder. Thousands of well-wishers saw the mouse pass, craning their necks to behold her. All at once, she went pale. Her palms were like ice. Her face wore a stricken expression. Her eyes were transfixed by a family of mice crouched alongside the procession. <gasps> my mother, my father, Mahalia cried as she skittered on down to the ground. When she landed, her family rushed to her side, exploding with love, with relief, and with pride, a jumble of feelings too joyous to hide for the child they had lost had been found. See, she runs to join her family and they're all reunited. You know what that means? They all got back together again. And so we take leave of Mahalia's tale, a story of stout self-reliance, an epic account on, on a miniature scale of a mouse who set forth on life's bumpy trail and succeeded by simply refusing to fail. Mahalia, Bachelor of Science. And there's Mahalia at the end with her diploma. And that's the story of Mahalia Mouse. Huh? Do we have time for one more book or should we wrap it up? Okay. That's all for today. I tell you what, I'll sing to you as you leave, okay? I'll sing you the song of the last one as you get up and leave. I don't mind you all leaving while I sing. You go off with your moms and dads and have a wonderful day, okay?